Okay. We're good. We're going live. Okay. Thanks. Let's give it a few seconds to let everyone's audio get connected and you know to go live. Okay. Is Ryan connecting? Well, I just wanted to um, thank you all and welcome you all to our PCEF committee meeting this, this evening. Um, I want to also thank you all for spending your time with us here on a sunny afternoon. I know that it's, it, it's a big ask, and so just really appreciate everyone coming in and, and being here with us. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a rare spring sunny day like this, and I know that we cherish them, so thank you. Um, at the same time, I, I want to acknowledge that you know not everyone certainly has access to engaging in this way on Zoom, and that many of the community members that are part of PSEF, that PSEF is meant for, are not able to be in this space here today. So I just want to want to hold that as as we as we move into the meeting, and 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 want to thank you all for holding space for us today. So with that, I will send it over to Katie to walk a little bit through our our our, our, our bit for the day. Evening, all. Um, so just sort of for the folks on YouTube, this is the Portland Clean Energy Fund um, committee meeting for April 14th. Um, the virtual participation guidelines are a little bit different today in that there is a 15 minute break in the middle where we're going to um, encourage members of the public to enter into breakout rooms and chat with each other or with committee members um, about whatever is on your mind. Um, so, but there is still a place for public comment at the, um, at the front of the meeting. It'll start a little bit. We started a few minutes late, so it's gonna be um, a few minutes after that. If you want to provide public comment, please put your name and indicate that desire into the chat box. The chat box is also where, um, where you can put your name, if you have an organizational affiliation you wanna share, if you have gender pronouns you want to share, put those into the chat box as well. And I'll be introducing committee members and the staff who are participating in the meeting and also encourage other staff who are not participating but who are listening in to introduce themselves in the chat as well. We hold the raised hand function um, for conversation to try and to help manage conversation in this platform with committee members and ask that while those deliberations are going on that um, members of the public act as, as observers. Same with the microphones and cameras, we ask that members of the public who are, who are here act as observers, except during that 15 minute break or during the public comment period. This meeting is being recorded and it's also being live streamed on YouTube. For, and maybe just a note that during the breakout rooms, um, folks on YouTube won't have access to that. So that will just be sort of a, a screen that will, for the, for the 15 minute break, there will just be a slide up on the YouTube channel that says that we're, that we're in a break. Um, there's also closed captioning available and you can find that by going, navigating on your Zoom bar and um, going to those three little dots and then on the drop down menu, you should be. You should see an option to view the full transcript, and that's where you can see the the live captioning. So, with that, I think that we will move to introductions, and we'll start with committee members, and then move on to staff. And um, just a, a, another reminder, in case anybody joined late, that if you're a member of the public, please do introduce yourself by putting your name, your organizational affiliation, and your gender pronouns into the chat box. And if you want to provide public comment, um, indicate that in the chat box as well. So we'll start with committee members and we'll start with Francis. Hi everyone, uh, Francis Ginatino Viatoro, he, him pronouns, uh, committee member. Robin. Good evening, Robin Wang, committee member, he, him, committee member. Michael. Uh, Michael Eden Hill, he, him pronouns, committee member. Maria. Hi, Maria Sabin, committee member, she or they pronouns. Megan. Hi everybody, Megan Horst, committee member, she, her pronouns. 
Jeffrey. Jeffrey Moreland, uh, he, him pronouns, committee member. Amanda. Hi everyone, Amanda Squimpanyazi, she, her pronouns and committee member. And Faith. Oh, you're muted, Faith. Hi everyone. Sorry about the camera shuffling going on over here. Um, committee member Faith Graham and she, her pronouns. And Shanice Clark is our other committee member who is going to be um, joining the meeting a little bit late today. So now we'll start with introducing staff who are participating in the meeting and we'll start with June, who is the tech lead today. June. Oh, you're muted, June. That's tech savvy June right there. <laughs> I know, no faith in me anymore. Sorry, y'all. Uh, June Ray is she, her pronouns. I'll be answering all the stuff in the chat and trying to put some helpful stuff in there for you all, too. Thanks, June. Wendy is going to be taking notes today. Too many buttons to push. Hi, Wendy Kelfkin, she, her, piece of staff. I will be diligently recording what happens today. I am Katie Lister, um, piece of staff, she, her, and I will send it over to Sam. Thank you. Sam Brasso, he, him, piece of staff. And I'll go ahead and do the usual and read folks that have spelled out their names in the chat box. Um, so we've got Greg Har, he, him with us from Solar for All. James Valdez on the team, piece of staff, he, him. Angela Previdelli, she, her, piece of staff. Deidre Schutz, uh, she, her, from Nutrition Garden Rx. Janet Hammer, she, her, piece of staff. And Jay Richmond, they, them, piece of staff. All right. All right. So I'll just run through the agenda pretty quickly. Everybody has received a copy of it and it's also posted um, online for the folks um, for the folks who are joining or watching on YouTube or who are joining on members of the public. Um, there was also a memo that was sent out that was associated with this meeting, and that is also available online, but it's not, it's probably not something that we'll be displaying during the meeting, but you can um, view it online. And I see June just put the, put the link to, um, to that into the chat box as well. So um, the next thing, it doesn't look like anybody signed up for public comment in the chat box, so um, we're going to move right into program updates. And that is you, Sam. Make sure I unmute. Okay. Um, and no one caught us. So I will just acknowledge this in case folks are wondering. We're, 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 we're behind a few on some committee meetings, meeting minutes that we will bring to y'all. So we will bring a, a log of them to you all in the next committee uh, committee meeting for approval. But, but just a, as, as a note, since we've, we've, we've fallen behind a little bit on those. But thank you for your patience. <laughs> so in the program updates, for this, just I want to, and, and I hope that this is a style and something that we do in a little bit more regular format. I think it's going to take us a minute to get here where we flush out and provide a little bit deeper updates. I suspect that'll happen probably every other meeting or so, but I think that this is a really an important point for us to pause and, and reflect on a lot of the other work that's happening so that as we get into the next RFP process, I think it's just important to do that level setting for some of the work that we're doing that we don't always come to you with um, in, in, in committee meeting updates. So that's that's a little bit what we'll do here. And so with that, um, Katie, I'll ask if you can move to the next slide. So I, I used this slide because I liked it, but it was really just to speak to the fact that it feels like ages ago since our original council meetings when you all were, were, were seated. Um, and some of those early meetings that we had all over the city, which I, I certainly had a lot of fondness for. You know, since that time, we've gone through quite an evolution since then. I know. J I don't know, you may, Dennis, we can chat about that another time, but, but, but we've gotten through quite an evolution since then. And we started originally, as we, as we staffed you on those meetings with just five members, all of us showing up to prep and set up tables and food and everything for those committee meetings. And now 11, 11 and a half um, full-time FP, almost 11 and a half full-time FP. That'll, that'll be starting May 3rd, um, which by city standards, I, I think is, is, is quite a growth. Um, and we still have another position to recruit for um, uh, shortly or to, to fill. 
So um, that's just a little bit of as we speak to the program updates. I really wanted to just also continue on with with, with how we've how our work is evolving. Um, and so I know I, I tend to think of like the sun in this image as as the, and the igniting of the sun as, as like the first conversations that spark peace up, which there may be debate about even that. Um, but that's what I like. And I think right now we're sort of in the in the tetrapod stage, um, but we're we're about to make a leap into into higher functioning and and, and move into the next stages. So. Um, what this means overall is that we're really we're no longer solely function on program design and development, but but we actually have grantees um, and and fortunately a rock star grants management team. So um, was as we think about some of the better ways in which we engage community and develop capacity, I think that that's a little bit of, of, of what we'll do here on the next slide and then and as well speaking to the team and, and, and how we sit, fit within the bureau. Um, next slide, Katie. So I just want to share where a lot of the work that, that's happening right now and a lot of the work that's happening, it's really, um, and maybe sequence wise, I could stop this to do this better, but a lot of the work that we're doing now is focusing on grantee onboarding. So a good chunk of the team, I'd say at least four or five members of the team also the left side of this page um, is all focused on, you know, working with all of the 38 grantees on their 45 proposals and digging, diving deeper into their scopes of work working through their reporting requirements, establishing their communications approaches, understanding the disbursement processes, whether grantees getting quarterly advances or receiving funds on a reimbursement basis. There's a, there's a whole host of things there that we're working through at the same end, working through city infrastructure and figuring out ways in which we can, um, for lack of a better, uh, work with other folks um, and take some of the, the power that PSEF has harnessed to, to address challenges within city um, city accounting and other things that, that we know are going to be just sticking points in places where we are going to spend a lot of time, as well as grantees are going to be spending a lot of time. So that's a lot of the, the work that we're doing now, uh, both with grantees as well as to make that, that process better. And our aim is to have all of our 45 awarded proposals executed um, uh, within 60 days from the city council approval. So that's just speaking to a little bit of, of some of the work that we're doing on the, on the grantee onboarding. And I, I don't want to understand that it's it's um across that team. It's 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 a lot of it's it's a lot of contracts. It's a lot. It's a lot of pieces, and it's it's important. And there's it's both important and critical work we get done right first, as well as these first onboarding meetings. But um, it's also going to set the stage for how we how we learn and tweak these processes as we go forward and in and, and, and future cycles onboard more grantees. Next is the piece I want to speak to, and, and, and I, speak, I spoke to most of this in, in the memo as well, if, in case folks feel like they, they want to go back, but just so you know, it's also there as well, or some of this is there. But, you know, last year we ran several community engagement events in order to hear from folks about shaping the program. We did this through workshops. We did this through public comment. We did this through dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of one-on-ones, as well as uh, stakeholder presentations to you know, evening presentations at a culturally specific community gathering and other places. This year, we're doing many of those same activities, but we're going further in how we engage community, trying to further connect with those that represent piece of priority populations that may not have received funding, as well as those that may not necessarily see themselves in the program and may not have shown up. So we're both continuing to do the work to get feedback on all the things that we did, you know, on all the pieces we connected with folks last year, but we're taking it a step further and going out to folks now. So, some a couple of those ways that we that I described in the memo, um, and 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 in in June we'll be diving into deeper next week, pending our conversation with our co-chairs tomorrow. Um, but it is is one, a couple of the efforts are, you know, one of them, we're 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 working on delivering community-centered workshops for nonprofits to, you know, develop a deeper understanding of what we can fund and how that can align with some of the projects that they're thinking about. Um, it's really a space where folks can come together and workshop their proposals and further develop their, those proposals. So we're working on those and we've got a handful of different formats for those that are focused, that are more tailored and focused on uh, and more hands-on for a handful of grantees and folks that we're inviting into that space, as well as workshops that are more tailored and open to the general public. And these materials will all be posted online. So, and we're doing that with, with, with Basque Studio as, as our contractor for that. We're also working on a, on a broader community engagement plan where staff is uh, working on a cohort model. And this is what, what we're calling broadly our, our outreach cohort that, 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 that we're going to be launching in fall of this year, which is really a complementary strategy to our workshops, 
where we're working in those particular workshops, we're working with folks that showed up to the program, showed up, expressed an interest, and we're going to be working with them to help refine and workshop their proposals. In our outreach cohort model, we're really going out to those that didn't show up, those that, that are the harder to reach priority populations by extending our reach and contracting with a cohort of six um, community connectors is what we're calling them, um, who will be receiving a stipend and tasked with designing and organizing culturally relevant piece of community events. And so as in the next part of the conversation, we will we'll outline the fact that this may be a great cohort potentially to be ideal candidates for community reviewers in the third piece of RFP, since this will be a cohort that we're going to be working really deeply with to make sure they understand the program um, and that they're doing that work and connecting with folks that just that we're not that aren't showing up. Um, and so all of this, um, we're going to provide a deeper dive where we, we, we will, we're going to be chatting with Marie and Michael tomorrow in our co-chair check-in to see, you know, what, what's on next on the agenda. But we anticipate this may be one of those things that we dive deeper into um, so you all get a better sense for how we're thinking about the, these, these particular community engagement, which when I describe it as higher functioning, it's, it's really taking it to the next level of how we, how we start to do that more deeper intentional engagement with folks. Um, and then lastly, and this is this I didn't know in the memo, but we are also convening and working with Lara Media Services to pull together a focus groups so that we can understand how to better talk about PSAF in ways that connect with the priority populations. So that's also work that that's just happening is bringing together a whole host of different focus groups so we can really workshop and understand the language we're using as we talk about PSAF and making sure uh, and finding what, what's the right language that resonates with community as we talk about that. Um, so again, this is just a sneak peek, and so we'll we'll get a we'll get an opportunity to dive into that next week. Um, and all of this is is uh, is, is part of broadly, I would say, is equally part of some of the ways in which we think about capacity building and working with organizations and helping develop their capacity. But there's a whole host of other work we're doing around capacity building as well. Um, and next with that, um, I, what I wanted to pivot our attention to is just speak a little bit about the evolution of the team from sort of a, a startup team and, and a five member team to what we are in, in, in short and, you know, starting our, our financial analyst was our most recent hire. We'll be starting with us on May 3rd. So just speak to that evolution. Um, and then uh, in the next slide, I'll talk about where we sit within the broader bureau. So folks have some of that situational context, which I know we haven't necessarily provided in the past. Okay. So recognizing that maybe this may be a good point, recognizing that you're going to get a deeper dive into community engagement. I, I just want to check, are there any, oh, one slide back, Katie, if you can. Uh, I want to check if there are any questions just about the onboarding as well as the, um, as well as the, uh, the, the, if there are any initial questions about the community engagement. Okay. So. It looks like Megan has a question. Just a really brief question, Sam. You mentioned um, the focus, some focus groups with the consultant, and I mean, I'm assuming we'll get a report out, but I guess I'm just hoping we do <laughs> when those happen. And is there? I, did you say what I, time those, when those are happening? I need to check back in with the team. Um, I, I, I think it took us a little longer to get that contract going because um, our, our, our procurement, you know, it, it, there, there's more, there's more challenges within procurement and just departures within the city. So take us longer. So I know that originally our time frame for that was originally running those focus groups in May. So I need to check back in with the team just to see whether we're, 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 we're still, whether, whether that's still on track for that. And that's something that I know that June can speak to next week as well. So I, so I, I there, there will be a report as part of that um, or some documentation that we can figure out how to share with you all. Um, and I expect that timeline um, and we'll get an update on that timeline next week after the meeting. Randy? Not much of a question, just more of a comment. Um, just very excited to hear about um, all this development. I think it's really exciting and a new uh, next new stage here for, for PCEF and really excited to hear, you know, um, this contract with Lara Media and sort of trying to capture some of this language uh, with the broader community. I think I think the challenge with any grant making program, especially for an institution um, built from the city, it's we just use different metaphors um, than than we do in the broader community. So here in the city, like it's really about you know business, and I think we're kind of stuck on sort of how we our relationships with business and how we grant and vendors. Like you know we talk about grantees as vendors, and it's there's a challenge, and I think in the broader community, I think just has different metaphors around how we talk about engagement or, 
you know, uh, she, you know, sometimes I feel like in many senses, uh, my past work, it's been more of a food metaphor in terms of how we build community and build a table. So I'm really excited just to hear and synthesize how, how we sort of update our, our language, not just at PSA, but how it reflects in, in all our materials moving forward. So I'm just kind of excited and uh, interested to learn um, those case studies. Um, but yeah, thank you for all that work. Maria? Thank you, Sam and Katie, for generating this evolving org chart for us. It was one of the earliest pieces of feedback we gave in the co-chair meeting, and you took Michael's comment and turned it around. So this is great. This is also part of um, co-chair's interest in creating a little bit more um, clarity around who does what on the PSEF staff and for committee members to have um, an easier resource to navigate so that you can all reach out to people depending on like their subject matter expertise or their area of work within the PSEF team to answer some of your questions that might not get addressed here. And you might have heard Sam reference the co-chair meeting check-in after this meeting. Michael and I are trying to have this regular check-in immediately after the, the PSEF committee meetings, but not after as in 10 p.m. <laughs> And there was a little confusion on that desire, but we're going to try to check in within the next few days so we can work through some of the, the comments and feedback that we get in this forum and not forget about it so we can turn around and, and assign tasks and work through something before the next committee meeting. Thank you for that, Maria. And um, yes, and thank you for that rant face. Um, it's 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 been it's been quite a it's been quite a ways and I think it's 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 all of what you're saying is just a, a show of just such such talented staff. I mean, I think when I and I can I can it's it's we've we've got great folks really thinking about this and and so much of the work that we did in the first year is building each of these pieces up. So you're going to continue to see this evolution as we continue to just further build on the on on the existing work that we have as well as revisit. The work that we've built and figure out how to do that better. So um, I'm I'm really excited, and a lot of this is just a, a product of a really, really, really talented team, and you'll continue to see that. So um, I hope that we'll make sure that we we start bringing more of these pieces around. But I want to just start with here. I this is this is a piece that it's 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 been involved, and we started as a startup team, and so I know that we're I'm already behind. So I'm going to just go quickly and at least name the individuals here behind these because I I, I realized once I created this slide, I was like, oh, I that and Megan, you thank you for that comment. Um, so uh, uh, something that I shared later with them, that, that I hope with you all is that congratulations to Katie to, to being promoted as a deputy program manager. So now Katie's supervising the grants management team. That includes Angela Parvidelli as the grant systems analyst, um, Wendy um, Kalskin as the clean energy project manager, Jay Richmond as the workforce and contractor development project manager, and then um, uh, David Granfield as a regenerative ag and green infrastructure project manager. We've got June in our community engagement manager role. We've got Lockie all. June Reyes in our community engagement manager role, lock y'all in our communications manager role. And then and, and then the, the, what you're seeing in the rest of these roles, and I will acknowledge this is, this is still evolving as, as we've evolved as a team. And so I, I put this here, but I want to know, acknowledge that there's still our roles we're still teasing out, but James largely in the capacity building and policy lead role and, and many other pieces, as well as Janet in the evaluation and systems lead pieces. We've still got an administrative specialist position that is that we haven't opened up a recruitment for that, um, Taken, we had to take a pause after a few of the recruitments that I hope that will open up uh, next month. And then um, we've got a financial analyst um, role that we've just uh, hired for. Um, uh, we accepted our position offer, I think, last Friday or Thursday. We'll be starting on May 3rd. And we have, we've had a half-time financial analyst that, that has been with us um, since the start. So just speaks to a little bit of this, and we'll continue. Pull, and I think that I suspect the next step will just be getting this information online so that so that others more broadly have access to this and, and see how this is laid out. So there, there's, um, as, as folks have seen our website, um, and, and, and I think can commiserate, it, 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 it's, a, it's a piece of work. There's work to be done there. And so um, there, there's just a big, there's a big backlog of work. And so that if you don't see it, it's, it's not because we're not thinking about it. So I, I please keep nudging us as there are things that you see. And, I'll, and we'll also share like, that's, that's, here, that's that, here's, here's where that exists. So, um, okay, next slide. And this just so that folks know where we sit within the broader Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. So we've got our director, Director Durbin, and then we've got really three core, three or four core areas. We've got our planning, planning side of the Bureau, which has about 
nine teams under it, anywhere from two members on a team to six members on a team. We've got our sustainability side, which is where we where we where we sit. We've got our internal services. This is sort of our community, our broader bureau communications staff, our HR services, other pieces, and then we've got our equity and engagement um, team. Within the sustainability part, uh, part of our team, um, right now, I do report to the director, the bureau, the director of bureau planning and sustainability. But um, historically, I've reported our chief sustainability um, chief sustainability officer, and so that position is currently vacant. So right now, we report. Uh, to the director, but you see some of the other teams that we collaborate closely with. We have a sustainable engagement and waste team. Um, and then we've got a climate, energy, and sustainable development team, which does leads a lot of the policy and climate action planning efforts within the Bureau. All right. Megan? Sorry, I guess I have lots of comments and questions already tonight, but I love org charts, apparently. Um, Sam, this is really helpful to like situate where we sit. And I'm curious, um, I know the Bureau of Plan the sorry, the Planning Commission is also I'm just curious if you can name any other advisory boards that are sort of like us in any way, shape, or form that we should be like aware of. And maybe maybe there's opportunities to have cross like maybe there'd be reasons to have cross advisory committee dialogue at some point. One that comes to mind to me is the planning commission um, because they come up with policy proposals around planning and it may be that our grantees identify planning like policy barriers to work. And anyway, that's just one reason I'm bringing that up right now, but I'm just curious if you can name any other kind of similar bodies to ours and where they sit in this flow chart. I think, and I think what you're speaking to similar bodies, similar functioning bodies, similar topic areas. So I'd mentioned the children's levies allocation committee, but that's different. It's, it has a similar function to us, but they don't do similar topic areas. So um, I almost want to get back to you on that. Obviously the planning and sustainability commission is the obvious one. Um, I, I, I suspect that there are probably other com co co committees with the Portland Bureau of Transportation that we inevitably at some point may, may have overlap with um, as well as there's there's a, there's a design review committee which reviews broader city planning. So there's there's other ones, but um, and 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 I want to I want to I wanna check in and get back to you. You know, a lot of work, a lot of the work that we'll be doing and th that are things that we connect with that will be permitted. And I I know I shared with you via email, but you know, there's a lot of work that we've been doing with the uh, Bureau of Development Services as well to just explore and understand and, and and work through some of the permitting challenges we anticipate some of our grantees will have. And so we'll see whether there's correlated bodies there on the permitting side. So I think that's a list that we can come back to you on because um, I'm sure there's many bodies in the city that I, I'm not aware of that, that we're related to. Renfis, I saw your hand go up and down. Did you have a question? I think Sam addressed it. I think it was just sort of similar to Megan's question there around like BDS and and you know procurement and how we connect, but it sounds like uh, we'll connect on that in the future. So thank you. Yeah, that's I appreciate that because really procurement. That it, as I was closing up, I was, those are some of the latter thoughts that I had was just around the, the we we have a we have a handful of bodies in procurement that that that'll connect to a lot of the types of work and types of conversations we've had here. And so I know that um, Janet and I have talked a lot about the fact that there's a lot of the same people. We will you know we've talked about our high roads body. Um, a lot of the folks that we've talked, a lot of the, there's a lot of overlap into some of the folks that we would potentially recruit in the high roads body. So that's something that I think we can similarly come back to. Um, and so we'll think about just how to, how to share that information. Right. Ready to move on? All right. And so before even moving on, before moving on to the next slide, I think the reason we wanted to share that is that you, 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 you know, we, we spent a good chunk of um, this past year working with you all to develop this RFP, and now we have our grantees. And so as part of that, there's just a good bit of the staff capacity and team capacity that is now shifting to working directly with those grantees and making the and, and, and helping them be successful and making that work now truly happen. And so I wanted to speak to that evolution because it had been, um, we, we 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 had been a startup team that had been in every meeting. We we huddle after every single every every meeting. We would meet for a committee meeting, then we'd meet from nine to nine thirty afterwards. And that was not 
we, we've talked about that. I think they, I think the staff were calling um, that up. That, that that did not work over time. It's a practice that sort of organically came about. And so it's just there's been there's been a range of evolutions in terms of how we've worked and how we structure our work and how we connect with the team. And I think that it's just important to get some insight into that as this conversation will be really important as we come back back around later in the year as we start talking about potential code changes and start thinking through that um, because our our administrative cap structure all of those have have big implications in terms of how we get to do our work and the and the level of service we, we provide okay so with that then let's start talking about the next rfps i'll, I'll frame I'll, I'll frame maybe if we can slide I, before we get to these words take it back one slide katie because i can i can talk to sorry i i i know um <laughs> I, I think that the context I wanted to provide here, just a couple pieces that, that we start out with before we start jumping into and talking about the next RFP. The, the, the first thing is that in our proposed budget, we're, are, we're planning on going out in the next fiscal year. So the fiscal year being starting July 1st, 2021 through June 30, 2022. For that, for, the, for that time period, we're planning on releasing $60 million um, for, for PSEC projects. It's, it's a large amount. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a large amount and it reflects the fact that um, while there was a lot of uncertainty in the fund value early on before um, before really getting to this point, it was really in about the past three months that we got a lot of certainty around what 2019 year revenues were. That was the first year that entities were subject to, to PSEF, yet those folks, their taxes really didn't come due until October 2020. So it's really the first time when we got a really solid picture of what that is. And so for our first year revenues, we are talking about the, the first year incoming revenues. It was it was north of 60 million, and so it gives you a sense that that's 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 like and, and as much as um, the, the the pandemic has has had real impacts, I, I suspect that because of the measure and the way that it's structured, we're going to be getting that sort of amount, a similar similar amount annually. And so what that means is we've got we've now we've now operating on a lag. We've, we've, we we have a fund balance. And so this next year we're budgeting 60 million. I suspect the, the, the year after that we'll be budgeting um, potentially even more. So that's just the framing to start out. This, this year we'll be moving out. That's, that's, that's really um, to move anything less out, I would just share it would be um, from a, 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 it's obviously we do not, we do not, there's no intent to grant to entities that do not have the, you know, that, that, that are not eligible, but um, if there are 60 million in eligible projects, um, that it is the intent uh, to, to move that sort of that level of resources out in order to remotely stay on top of what is coming in. So I'll just I'll start with sort of that as the as a starting place for the conversation. And then the second piece is, as we as we've proposed is that we consider two proposals to move that. So two proposals that are identical, 30 million each in each proposal, um, in order to in order to move those resources. Um, in order to and, and a large part of that was in response to a large significant amount of feedback that we heard that folks would like more than just one sort of um, <laughs> thinking about your metaphors, bite at the apple in, in a year. Folks would like to have more than one opportunity to apply for PSEF funds. And so that's sort of where we started in structuring a timeline here, recognizing that there, there's many which ways that we can adjust things. Um, but, but wanted to at least outline sort of those two pieces that we're, we're, we're starting with um, as, as we frame out the, the planning for the next RFP. Just it's, it's ambitious. Okay. Do folks have any questions about that? Only because I think Megan might have one. I'm, I'm going to say I'm sitting here quietly. <laughs> or even oh, or I, even thoughts, if not questions. I do actually yeah. have one, Thank but you. I don't want to jump ahead of anybody else. <laughs> I'll I'll go because I don't see anybody else raising their hand. But Sam, I just don't um, I didn't hear you mention the mini grants. And I remember a year plus ago we approved them. And where are they in this discussion? This I, I it was very much on my thing because that is it, it's an important part of the program that fortunately uh, uh, Angela Provedelli is leading on and working up the the build out of the mini grants program. So that is something we are busy working on the build out and and, and, and structuring that and taking our lessons learned from the application support grants. So you all will get a presentation, um, get to check back in. We do have a, pre a presentation slated for y'all in, in five, in May? May 5th, May 5th. May 5th. Okay, yeah. great. Um, 
to talk about the mini grants. So um, that's uh, so we will continue that. It, it, it is a significant. Uh, it is going to be. It is not a significant effort, and it's an important part of what we're going to be what we're going to be moving out as well. Um, so apologies I overlooked that. Thank you, Megan, for flagging that. That is that is also a major evolution, and in the, in, the, in, in the work that we're doing is the, the quarterly mini grants program. Okay. All right. Then let's move to the next slide. So what you see here, we're in April, we've got another meeting next week. Um, and what we're hoping to do is come out of the meetings in the next next week and then the subsequent three meetings to really dive deep into some of those key decisions and key updates that we need to make to the scoring criteria um, and, and, and other criteria, eligibility criteria in order to adjust for from based on all the, all the things that we learned in this past cycle. Um, and things that we knew that we would need to adjust for, you know, last year as we approved this inaugural grant round because of other changes that, you know, main thing being, and we'll talk about this later, the grant cap being bigger. So um, what we said is ideally about working through that in four meetings. And the intent would be that these are criteria and this is um, uh, criteria we would be updating um, specifically for both RFP number two and three. So they would generally be identical. Obviously, if they're Things that we learn as we go out, process changes, we will make tweaks, but the, 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 the intent is for them to be pretty much the same RFP that we're releasing two different times. But um, the key decision point for the committee would be the, the public comment period. That is when we would, we, out through, through those four weeks, we'd be looking and soliciting feedback and input and making adjustments and then asking you all to make uh, approve the release of the scoring criteria for public comment. We'd hope to release those public comments for about three weeks in June, um, having just taken a lot of lessons learned from our last public comment. I think we can we can do that in about a three-week period. And then we would come back um, and have about two committee meetings to revise the scoring criteria in response to those comments. Um, and then in a third, approve the release of the RFP. Hopefully that would happen in about August of 2021. We would release it for 60 days again. We'd get into a review period starting in October of 2020. Um, 21 through January of 2022, um, and that, that would uh, that would be the review period. Yep, and then we would uh, we would announce ideally go to council and go through a similar exercise again, where we announce the awards in February 22. We would begin while we're going through the review period for RFP number two. We would release the RFP for RFP number three. Similar 60-day period. It would close out in December, early January, and we would begin the review period. For RFP number three in January, and so there would be this, this in this effort there'd be overlapping RFPs and review periods. And over time, I think the intent is to build more time in between them. But this is um, this is sort of what we've laid out, and uh, and I think that there's there's many iterations and different ways in which we can structure RFPs in the future. This is our proposal based on the fact that we received many proposals that were multi-criteria that were investing in clean energy and regenerative ag and workforce development. And so a lot of, in terms of the structure of the actual RFP and the type it was, um, or the, the types we were soliciting and soliciting proposals for all the RFPs worked well. And so that's largely why we're leaning again towards that that, that, that worked. We're gonna continue with that, but but there was certainly substantive updates within the, the questions themselves. So I know that the, the, that'll, we will we'll move to that in the next slide, but I just wanted to speak to sort of what allows us, you know, a big part of releasing that RFP number three in November is that it wouldn't really have substantive changes. It would be largely the same form as, as RFP number two. Faith? Tim, I was distracted when we started this conversation. Um, so I apologize because I know you've already shared this, but tell me why again the rationale between having two instead of one, two thirty million dollars instead of one sixty million dollars. I mean, the, the the big part was, I mean, it certainly there's an element of spreading the workflow in terms of the onboarding of grantees. I mean, when we when we get, I mean, and it depends on the grant cap, the grant sizes, and whatnot. But onboarding, I mean, if they, if, if it took a similar form, right? This year we've got for eight point six million, we have forty five uh, forty five proposals. Again, we could, there'll be adjustments. We know that going out, we, we've already heard the clear intent to have a larger cap. So we know that it might not be as, it might not be proportionally as many, that many more grantees, but it's, it's just the onboarding work is, is a significant level of work as well. 
But the key thing that I mentioned, and, and so that's an, that's an additional rationale I didn't share, but the key thing I mentioned was just hearing a lot of overwhelming feedback from the community that they'd want more than one go at being able to apply for funds and not have to, you know, once, you know, once you apply and you, you're not having to wait a full year before you can apply again. Um, and so this timeline is certainly based on sort of what we have to operate with this year. I think the intent and I think the hope would be in future years that we've got a, a larger spread between the RFPs, that it'd be really more like an RFP actually showing up every six months. Um, but um, working sort of backwards in, from releasing, uh, releasing, releasing 60 million in the next fiscal year, this is sort of what we, what we work to. Grand I just want to comment that this is one exciting. So I just want to you know that's this is kind of exciting. Uh, I do have some other big picture questions. Happy to sort of ask later down in the future slides. But I think the one no, I just I think of concern that I just want to raise here is just um, what this means for grant management moving forward, uh, and then just what this pace means for staff. So I just want to know that this seems like a pretty um, intensive um, process where we're just going from uh, RFP to RFP, then getting up ready for the next um, two RFPs. So, you know, I just want to sort of flag the, the pace uh, of what this means for, uh, for staff, um, you know, just recognizing we've already been going through a breakneck speed, um, which I think is, uh, you know, I think inherent in trying to build a program uh, and that we'll be jumping into that. So I think, you know, I don't think it's a concern that's a, for me to say, no, let's not do this, but it is a, for me, a concern to say, I'm, you know, concerned about what this means for, for staff, staff capacity moving forward. You know, what are the, you know, are we considering additional helping hands to making sure that we're doing this process in a, in a thoughtful manner uh, and doing this in a manner that's not um, um, leading to, I think, staff burnout. Um, so I, I think I think those are kind of just my central kind of key questions here. Um, because I think at any time, once we start thinking multiple multiple years, which in itself is, is exciting, uh, and it sounds like we're being responsive to the needs of the public, I think I'm just trying to raise at least those considerations, which I'm sure you've all been sort of thinking through, but that's just, I think a fly that comes to mind as, as we're, as I'm kind of digesting this a little bit. Robin. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing this. Um, I guess uh, in general, I, 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 I like this time frame, but uh, my question is, um, how firm is this? Is this like written in stone? Is it kind of, you know, hardened in cement? Or, you know, is some of the work that we'll be doing in the next few weeks and months, um, you know, can that influence this, this schedule? I, I think the thing that I would say, it's really important that we, we really try to stick to for a range of reasons is the moving the 60 million. I think in terms of the whether it's one solicitation, two solicitations. I think that that I think that 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 that's, that's there's implications that I want to I want to be clear about. You know, it's it's part of it is you know I know that we've talked about a larger and we'll get to this and so I don't maybe let me not jump ahead to the next conversation. It's really just um, working through you you if we move to one solicitation, understanding what that means when those grants all come through at one time, and and what is the flavor of those grants and the size of those grants. We have, you know, we, we took one approach this past year, and yet we know that we've always been pretty, I think there's always been a clear intent that I've certainly heard from the committee and that has been broadly talked about that the grant cap would be larger. And so just what does that actually start to look like in terms of the overall distribution of projects? Because if we have a grant cap that is 5 million, if we have a grant cap that's 10 million, granted the, the review of the applications will still take, the, we'll still get a lot of applications, but it may be that you don't actually have as many grants to onboard and just the implications of that across the board from the types of grantees that we are getting to provide grants to as well and, and, and a whole other thing. So there's just, there's a, there's, there's the considerations. And so I think Robin, what to, to answer your question, it's really the, uh, the 60 million, I'd say there's, 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 there's not, there's probably not gonna be much room on that, but um, in terms of what it looks like, but that's, that's an open conversation. And, and, and I'd hope that that's a conversation that we want to, for our planning purposes, 
um, really work through um, and hear you hear your thoughts today, certainly, and then and then we'll carry that into next week, um, ideally. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the way that we frame this is that, you know, what we acknowledge is that really, and I, and I be clear again, there's really two decision points that we're gonna build you all towards. First decision point is releasing the scoring criteria for public comment. And the second is ultimately releasing the RFP. But leading up to those decision points, there are several critical input areas that we're gonna seek from you all. And I'll just list them all and then we'll go through them one by one, but it's, you know, threshold scores and review and how we go about that. Um, community and committee scoring, um, the grant cap, workforce training grants, innovation, anti-displacement. These are things that we've identified as really key things that are gonna be really important that we spend some time on as a full committee that are gonna be important um, for both just having gone through this last cycle important for, for applicants and, 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 and others in terms of better understanding. We know through this cycle, you all have also pulled apart pieces of information and things that you all saw like, and, and you all, and we've had conversations and examples, the conversation that, you know, Robin, you have had with, with, with Katie around how we evaluate, by, you know, the, the, the finance section and, and the scoring of the application. So there's other nuggets of information we know that you all each bring, um, but these were some of the key major pieces that we've identified as staff and what we were, Proposing is, as before I go through this, that for all those other pieces of information, I think the one we are proposing in the next really two weeks that you email those to staff. And it could really be as simple as bullets and, and have follow up with us so that we can bring that back with Michael and Maria, sit down with them and really tease out how do we, how do we bring those forth and, and flush those out. So that's one is just for those other elements beyond this. And we know there are many, or there, there are certainly ones you all thought really hard about. To, to, to email as simple as a bullet, like I've been thinking about this and, and how we did this so that we can we can follow up and kind of pull those together and figure out how we, knowing knowing sort of what we're trying to do, how we how we bring that together. Um, so that's at least the, the, some of the pieces we were thinking about in terms of bringing some of the, some of the nuggets that you all have been holding. Um, in addition, I'll acknowledge that we will also be doing interviews with you all shortly and then we've got to still schedule those with staff to, as, as follow up and debrief. And so we know those will elevate other things as well. So those are just two avenues in which we were hoping to, um, for some things that aren't listed here, um, for hoping to pull your feedback. But as we think about just these individual elements, um, I'll just walk through a few of the things, the questions that we have, and this certainly is also in your memo. So don't feel like you're, you're left with it just here. Um, we want to make sure that you feel that You've heard them here, we've talked about them to some extent and that you can go back and review the memo and, and think about them some more. But some of the threshold review pieces, we know there's gonna be more grants, but we wanna talk about, should there be a minimum number of points required for an application to be advanced to a scoring panel? Should the initial review eliminate a portion of the lowest scoring applications from scoring panels? So should staff do the initial review and let's say we only advance one and a half times the funding to scoring panels. So if the funding is $30 million, we only advance $45 million in proposals, the highest $45 million to scoring panels. Um, so some of those questions, you know, and, and, and some of those considerations that we wanna go through, because as, as you know, we've certainly talked about what it means. We wanna just get, get, come up with different ways and structure different ways. I know that it was really critically important for all of you all to be on scoring panels this first year, but we wanna make sure we, we, we have a, and, and see every single proposal, but as we as we scale up, it's going to be under, it's going to be important that we figure out how we how we how we manage both your capacity um, as well as the, the the number of grants in an efficient way. Um, I'll share the next is just you know <laughs> your 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 participation. Um, it's really you know I know that when we when we did the exercise in the last committee meeting, there's a lot of interest in scoring panels, and I really it, it, it brought a lot of warmth to me because it's it's a, it's a the deep part of the process, but at the same end, it is, it is a part of the process where you all um, really got to see and, and, and connect with the proposals. So certainly see that. And so the question we want to ask is, you know, are all committee mem members going to be sitting on scoring panels? And you know, we want to recognize that each of you all have to make a decision about how to best use your time that you give and whether your time can be spent on other pieces of PCEF work. Um, and we also know that um, hopefully as the state of this pandemic eases and we, we shift that Folks will get their, get more of their lives. We might not be able to get you all in the same way that we've been able to have you all have been incredibly available to us and we thank you for that. But we know that that's not gonna be the case indefinitely. Um, and so separate from that, the other piece and beyond that your, your, your scoring and your role in scoring is just the, the, the community scoring options. And so in the memo, we list a few different ways to think about community scoring. Um, 
knowing that that's it's a big body of work to, to bring in folks. And so there's sort of, we listed three options and um, really it was, there's a, the, 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 the in-depth option that we laid out was really the, um, uh, was, was an option where we talked about the outreach cohorts earlier. There's about six community connectors, maybe seven community co connectors that we contract with and work deeply with to, to, to help us do outreach and then make sure they really deeply understand the program and design outreach efforts for it. They could be a cohort that because we've worked deeply with them to understand the program, that could be a, a cohort that we could work with in order to be con, uh, con, potential scoring panel members. Um, and so that's, that's one way, but they really wouldn't be ready till RFP3. And so it'd be potentially foregoing scoring uh, community scores for RFP2 and working with them in RFP3. Another option is we do have scoring uh, community scores for the next RFP, but it's really a little bit more of a transactional model. We're paying for community members to be scorers, and that's what it is. It's, it's just acknowledging from a, a capacity to bring in, you know, six, seven, eight scorers that it really would be contracting with them, putting out the call, selecting them. We're doing a, doing a, a one, one session on the scoring criteria as well as one bias session and bringing them to scoring. So, and then there's probably option three, which is a combination and involves potentially drawing from organizations that are familiar with PSAS, either folks that applied last round or, or another structure and we just need to we may we just need to negotiate and come back to you all and think through and work with you all on the potential challenges with perceptions of conflict of interest that may arise there. Um, next key conversation you all are going to have to we're going to have to wrestle with is the grant caps. Last year they were capped at a million dollars. We heard clearly that we want a higher grant cap when we're going out with more money. So what does just just what does that look like? What does the right level of grant cap uh, feel like? So that's going to be a conversation. Another one is within the workforce development grant. Um, there is, you know, we saw, and early on we asked this question of what, how do you define workforce development? And folks said, I think some folks said, you know, sixth grade up. And so we did not define that, but I think as we saw the proposals come in, we think that there may be an interest and in, in, in a conversation, at least with the committee of, do we want to allocate, do we want to be more specific around um, allocations for workforce development that is targeted at the, you know, 12th grade and below versus really the, the sort of workforce ready workforce development projects and whether you may want to actually define allocations for those particular sectors. Um, next would be innovation. Just what does this category mean? In the code, it's written as the other category. We know that it's the place where transportation projects fall. Do we want to specifically call it an allocation for transportation out of the other category? Um, there's just some of those conversations in defining that. Um, and, and certainly we can see innovation falls into clean energy, into workforce development. There's a little bit of innovation in the green infrastructure and regenerative act. How do we want to define the other category and then really think about innovation and whether we want to know how we want to think about that. So that's another conversation. And then the last one that we know that there was a, a lot of interest last time that we promised we would hold space for this next round was displacement. You know, we, 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 we said there a lot of feedback of organizations in the last round to our initial scoring um, criteria was that some people said we're not advocacy organizations. We don't really understand, like we do this and displacement and anti-displacement. So it's a bigger thing that we, we in our role haven't thought about. And so we, we took some of those questions out, but there was a, when we go out for larger projects, we had proposed the idea um, that we would come up with a dollar threshold investment and potentially overlay that with a map. So we would find areas of the city that we know based on studies we've done that may be more prone to displacement. We would say, hey, there's a piece of proposal greater than, let's just say $2 million in this neighborhood as part of their grant agreement, if they're awarded a grant, they would need to work with our anti-displacement team within the bureau to come up with an anti-displacement plan. So that's, that's why, and so are there other considerations? So that's what we posited and think there was interest there and whether there'd be other considerations that should be incorporated in that effort. And those are conversations we're currently having with our planning side, which that, that work happens in. So those are just some of the critical input areas um, that we wanted to identify for you all. And I know we're about to go into a break here at seven o'clock, so maybe we have time for one question or two, so I don't wanna to get too far, but then when we come back, the hope is that we talk a little bit about some of those next steps here, just some of your reflections to, to this, both the timeline as well as these, 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 these critical input areas. Um, and then we can, we can craft together what the next, next committee meeting looks like before we, we move and talk about evaluation. We do have time for maybe one question or, or comment. If anyone has one, want to try and stick to, stick to the 15-minute the break plan.
Robin. I'll fill that time. <laughs> Um, so I got a question. You had meant, Sam. You mentioned earlier that um, you know you're, you invited us to send emails with you know feedback and and that you'll be scheduling some interviews, um, you know, with us. Um, just uh, I guess um, you know while I had a lot of ideas and thoughts while kind of reviewing the pan uh, the the applications, it's been like three or four months, and so there's a lot of cobwebs in my head as it pertains to um, PSEF. Um, and I, what I would find um, very useful, and maybe maybe not others, but um, is when you're doing the interviews, maybe have the interviews with two of us, uh, because what I find is that someone will say something that'll key off additional thoughts that um, might kind of open up some cobwebs, so to say. So um, <clears throat> that's something that I would be interested in. Again, not you know, others might not be, but if if that can be accommodated, I, I think it'll be very beneficial for me to recall some ideas or thoughts that I had during the process. Robin, I, I, pre I appreciate that feedback. Um, and so, and that, that may make it more efficient for us. So <laughs> um, what, what we will do is, um, what I'll do is I'll check in with, with, with Jen and other folks that have been thinking through and working on that. And just, and it may be that we come back to you and say, hey, we'd like to schedule this. Are you interested in a one-on-one -on -one or a paired interview? And so give folks a little bit of the option for folks that may want to just do a one-on-one. -on -one. So I think that's, I think that's great, and I'll check in. But great, great piece of feedback, and, and and we'll certainly make sure you have all the questions that we'll be asking beforehand to help jog some of those thoughts as well. Thanks, Robin, for filling that minute. Um, we are going to move into the breakout rooms now, um, because we don't have a large number of folks who uh, members of the public who are participating in this meeting. Um, I think we, the original plan was to go to three breakout rooms, um, but now we're just gonna go to two breakout rooms. One of the things that that does mean, however, is that one of the breakout rooms will have, um, um, will have five committee members. And so we will need to take notes now in the breakout rooms um, because you will be um, sort of in, a, in, a, in kind of a pseudo public meeting. So I just wanted to flag that because it's a little bit of a deviation from the original plan. I think maybe one thing we do want to continue to do this and maybe one thing we need to do is do, you know, as folks know that they can come and mingle if that's something they're interested in, maybe we'll get more participation, maybe do a little bit um, of more kind of getting the word out about it. So June is going to um, do some some technology that makes everyone kind of disappear into a pre-assigned uh, room. Members of the public, you can move rooms. Um, you will be automatically moved into a breakout room, but you have the option to move yourself um, into another room. There is a little a square with squares in it that is an uh, that is an icon that will show up once the breakout rooms are available, and that will show up on your on your kind of Zoom menu bar or at the bottom of your screen, kind of underneath people's where you see people's faces. And if you click on that, then it will give you the option to sort of like move around to different breakout rooms. Is there anything else about the breakout room, Sam? Uh, just that it's also a break. So feel it, it truly is treat it like you would a break when we were in person. You know, you go take your bio breaks or whatever else you need and, and also mingle and whatever else. So um, just, just make sure folks take care of yourselves in 15 minutes and, 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 and hopefully you enjoy each other's company. That's it. And just a quick note before we open it, if you're going to stay in the main session, just to be off video and mute because we will be still live streaming um, and we don't want to unintentionally capture any folks on the live stream. So I'm going to start opening up the breakout room. Thanks, June.
we just got torn apart from a really good conversation about Filipino baked goods. June. Maria, that's your favorite topic of conversation. <laughs> but actually, Amanda was talking about it. So it is my favorite, though. <laughs> I uh, suspect that folks are having too much fun. We were like, pull them in, pull them in. <laughs> well, we'd, love to, we'd love to hear how that went. Um, welcome back. Let's see, I think we're still Is bringing everyone we're still, back we're still in? folks travel. Yeah, I think folks okay. are still doing the travel back. Okay, your video is off and I think most everyone actually oh. is back. I don't know if Shanice has been able to join us yet. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. I was just busily repinning everyone. All right. Well, welcome back. It I look from most folks' expressions like that was a successful experiment. So be repeating it um, in future meetings. Um, so we're about we're just about five minutes behind, which frankly, you know, for for us I feel like is pretty pretty good and right on time. So we're um gonna I think Sam is going to talk for just about five minutes about kind of next steps in what the next steps are in talking about planning for the next RFP. And then we'll move into talking about um, evaluation, much of which is actually also about the next RFP and kind of how we're getting um, how, with the evaluation that we're doing to help inform improvements um, to the next to the next round or the and the next solicitation. So Sam, back to you. Thank you. Um, really, I think what we want to do, I just, it, it's pretty simple here. I, I think what we want is we've listed a handful of big items that, that, we, that, we, that are going to be critical decision points or critical input points that we're going to need from you all. And yet we know that there are probably others you're thinking about. So one, we will follow up with an email that just kind of acknowledges that mass that, that um, one, can you, you know, as you say, if there are things that you're thinking about, please email us so we can start compiling them, pulling them together and then and then flushing them out. And that may be through one-on-ones with staff because we follow up and we call you to talk those through, um, uh, but it may also come out in your interviews. So we'll, 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 we'll talk about those too. Um, otherwise, um, I think that uh, what we're hoping to do next week is to come back and some of the items that I listed in the, in the last slide, we wanna dig into those a little bit further um, and, and really just go through and really talk about the pros and cons and the implications for um, whether it's threshold reviews, community reviews, your reviews, um, some of the definitions, we'll really start to work through some of those um, and then start to create placeholder for some of the other things that are coming up. So the hope is that next week that we, we, we dive deeper, but then also um, also get a, a little bit of, um, and pending our converse, pending our, our check-in with Michael and Maria tomorrow um, to also potentially get a, 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 a deeper dive into how we're thinking about community engagement. So with that, I'd just love to hear any, I know that we're short on time, but if there are any initial thoughts that are coming up that can help us think about what um, what would be helpful for you all next week in your conversations as we sort of dive deeper into um, the, the next RFP planning. Randy? Um, well, I think I enjoyed this activity. Hopefully we just have a broader um, turnout from the community on this. Um, you know, I, I'm very particularly interested to see how we do move forward on um, community engagement and as, as a form of leadership development and getting community members involved. But I do, I do think a key point that's worth just resolving, which I think you've already highlighted, Sam, is just transportation. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, again, it's like probably probably the largest um, amount of emissions in our region or greatest potential for greenhouse gas reductions that I think it, it is something that we do need to address how we actually prioritize and reflect that in the application. And I don't think that just it being under innovation is um, a sustainable solution. Um, so I think I, I just I just wanted to at least um, share that with folks that I think it's I think it, I do think it's a priority that we figure out and address at some point. And uh, uh, I do like that it's being called out here, but I think it's got to be beyond just within the innovation bucket. Uh, the last piece I think it's worth highlighting and, you know, just, we'll leave this for, for staff to think about is 
how, you know, how will, you know, PSEF intersect with federal stimulus conversations, um, whether it's block grants, different community grants that will be coming in, try to get people back to work or build back better, um, as I think, um, you know, is, is, is this current saying right now for the, for the federal government about reinvestments? Uh, what's the, you know, what's the role for PCEF um, in, in matching funds, as being a program that matches funds? Um, so there's, just, I think, some key things really that should have been swirling around my head in terms of what's going to be PCEF's role or intersection there. So um, more just suggestions and thoughts than, than real, like, we need to do this right now, so. Thank you for those thoughts, Ramfis. To add to what Ramfi said, um, my interest in transportation is aligned in that, that same thought. And also what would it take for the committee to continue advancing transportation within innovation or on its own? Uh, can you remind us about code or policy changes or are these things that we can retool within um, the spaces and uh, resources we have with us right now. I'll just answer that. Yeah, Th thank you, Maria. And thank you, Ramfrey, for that point around uh, transportation. It, it is, I mean, transportation is the biggest, it is It is our biggest and growing source of emissions. Um, and, and yet it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, it wasn't explicitly called out within the initiative. And I can certainly, there is, um, there, there's, a, there's a longer history to why that wasn't, and we can get into why it wasn't called out. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll be direct. It was intentional that it wasn't, it wasn't called out. Um, and so, um, it is, it is a code, it, it is, it is a code change unless you were to fund it out of the other innovation bucket. Um, but, um, and, and so what we've, what I've been up until now, it was really get us through this first cycle, really maybe one more cycle, and then, and then bring together at that point, having gone through a couple cycles, seeing a full range of both both things that work well, things that don't work well, and full a full range of proposals all the way up to thirty million, sixty million dollar level. Really, at that point, to to start to level. You know, this year we kind of we had a good sense for the the overall level of subscription that we had to each of the funding areas. You know, this is how many clean energy projects. And it, it generally speaking, it lined up fairly well to the funding allocations. We had a lot of predominantly clean energy projects, a good chunk of probably workforce development is probably oversubscribed in terms of interest. So there's, there's a little bit of, um, of, of having gone through that and seeing sort of what is the demand and then coming back. Um, and our, our plan is to come back and after having gone through an onboard a handful of grantees to, to open those, the, the broad range of code adjustments. Um, so we can we can start, we've had a running list of things that you all are gonna wanna consider in terms of the, 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 the code conversations, both from administrative cap to transportation, to the way schools are called out within it, um, within, within the code and how schools could receive funding. So there's a handful of things and expectation was to, you know, as I know we are gonna be, Michael Mary, we haven't gone there to, to start really laying out that work plan for the committee, but as we lay out that work plan, the expectation was to, to get through the second round, sec, you know, the laying out this RFP and then begin the conversation and, 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 and necessary work that needs to happen to explore those, those realm of changes and make sure we're able to do our due, due, due diligence with you all, with the community around what those changes may look like. Okay, you're muted. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, Robin, I see Robin's hand up and then I also just wanted to check, Michael, I thought I saw your hand up, not your virtual hand, but your actual hand. So I just wanted, you know, okay, that was just a waving around of the hand. Robin? Yeah, I, I got a fly in here too. So if you see me doing that, it's because okay. it's a fly. Um, I'd like to, you know, have a conversation. I don't know if we're ready for it, right, at, at this point or this year, uh, but I'd like to have a conversation around, um, you know, multi-year grants. And I'm not talking two years or three years. I'm talking on the order of five to ten years. And, um, you know, it's it's a little bit of a leap. And I don't know if the code, you know, city code allows for it. But, um, you know, I think for some organizations who have projects that, you know, uh, that it's going to take years to to, you know, do the impact that they want to do. Uh, having to go year to year, you know, writing, you know, GAN applications, not knowing whether you're going to get funded for these programs or not, um, you know, really kind of doesn't, it's inefficient and it, it sets up, um, it just sets up this kind of, you know, potentially just bad cycle 
Um, and so if, if there is an opportunity to, you know, we see this project and it's good um, and, and maybe we funded it for two or three years and it's continuing to, to go, do good. Um, and there's a huge demand for that uh, and, and potential impact for that. Um, you know, I, I'd love to be able to entertain the possibility of saying, hey, you've, you know, um, you know we'll, we'll fund this project for, you know, five or 10 years, um, gives everybody a little bit of stability, um, planning, um, you can develop infrastructure and overhead to kind of accommodate that. Um, and I think it, it would really make it uh, easier for a lot of nonprofits to, to kind of continue doing that work and not have to worry about funding. So again, I, I think it might be a little bit too early right now, but I think you know to do that type of long-term funding, we have to start setting the stage now um, or, you know, potentially enabling that in, you know, year three or year four. Thanks, Robin. Uh, uh, and, and thank you, Robin. We'll check in with my, Katie, that would be a good question for a check-in with our, our city attorney, because there's this, yeah. there may be other ways. We, right now we're limited to five years. But yeah. there may be there may be something else. There may be something else. Whether it's a, but there may be another way we can structure it. I know contractually, the the, the agreements we can execute is for five years. But maybe I think else. right now what it would require is an amendment at the five year point, which doesn't offer the kind of assurance probably that you're that would be looking for in a in a longer term grant. Okay, I'm gonna, um, apologies for moving things along. I do, I do just wanna recognize that, you know, the sort of list of questions that Sam put out there and the, and the topics that he raised are ones, they're the sort of like high level ones that are, real, that are important for us to get, you know, the feedback the soonest from you on so that we can kind of keep, because it, um, you know, changes the trajectory of, of different bodies of work that, um, that we need to keep moving. Um, but that it was a lot. And so I think it'll be good for everyone to have the opportunity to sit with that for a week and then kind of take it um, a bite at a time starting next week. So let's move on to the next part of the um, meeting, which is the evaluation update. And Sam, do you want me to start on this slide or the, the next one? We'll just start here and I'll just share that. I'll just speak for a little bit. I hope that I can gain us a little bit of time back, share a little bit about evaluation overall, and then turn it over to the subcommittee members. We'll, we'll, we'll turn it back to you all eventually. So um, thank you. I want to just acknowledge the work of the subcommittee as well as Janet in doing this work and, and Angela in, in supporting that as well. So really appreciate that and we'll, we'll jump in. And, and this first slide, I'm just going to, I mean, I, we bring, we bring this up here to kind of ground us in the guiding principles, but I think we can, we can, we can, we can move us on from here. You see it, you're grounded, good. <laughs> so this, this slide here is to call out just a few of the evaluation reporting elements that sit within the code. So within the code, and we've talked about this, is that there's a requirement to adopt the methodology to track and report to the public, the mayor, city council around the effectiveness of this program and meeting its, its goals which is about implementing the climate action plan in a way that's, that's more equitable. Um, again, you're, we're also required to prominently display our, 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 our how we're doing in meeting um, both measurable and ambitious goals for workforce training, hiring, and, um, and the hiring of historically disadvantaged groups. And then there's a handful of not necessarily direct evaluation specifically uh, elements, but they're, they're elements that we are gonna be evaluated on that are within the code both our financial audit that happens annually that we'll be um, turning on soon as we get our, our, new, our new financial analysts on board, as well as our performance audit, which the auditor's office is currently conducting the first one. The future ones would be conducted by an external entity that we hire on. Um, so those are just some of those elements that we wanna call your attention to and bring back up. Next slide. Despite some of those elements that are certainly required in the code and are important elements to, to, to make sure that they are there as a point of accountability and requiring them. For us, evaluation is in everything that we've done. I mean, from the very get-go, we've recognized that what we're doing, I mean, not to, to you know, not to, but it is groundbreaking. I mean, I don't want to underestimate that, but the work that, that is happening here is groundbreaking and it's incredibly important that we understand and we're checking in it. We're checking in at every step of the process. And that happens in many different formats that we're going to speak about in the next slide. But I just wanted to 
speaks to the fact that when we've from the very get go, when we've said sort of stick with us, this is a this is a process of the ride that it really is, and it's part of that process that that ride or that journey that we're on. All of this, it is about continuous learning and continuous improvement and continuous evaluation in everything that we're doing. So when we will be evaluating the program, we're going to be looking at specifically like what happened, what were the outcomes that we got, you know, what, what, how many how many folks were trained, how many greenhouse gas emissions were reduced, how many dollars were saved for folks' energy bills, those sorts of things. But also just how we did, what was the process, how did we actually, what was folks' experience um, in, in, in working with us and what worked well. And those are some of the elements that we're really diving deeper into now, since that's a lot of what we have to work with, whereas some of those what happened are going to be coming down the line as our grantees get into their projects and report that information. So a lot of our focus now has certainly been on the second part, this, this how we did uh, and how we did our work. Next slide. Just, just some of the things that we've done to date is just here's a, a, a screen of just some of our reporting and evaluation. And it, and it really is, I wanna acknowledge that that evaluation has occurred in every conversation, every bit of community feedback that we've had to inform our key products, our outputs, our processes, and it comes through one-on-one -on -one through sending all our various drafts and saying, hey, we'd like to get your, we'd like to hear from you. Does this sound right? Is this, and, and so we've, we've done a whole host of evaluations on a lot of, the, a lot of the products that we've produced. We've done evaluations on the events that we've pulled together. And so whether it's folks showing up to committee meetings, when we first started in Zoom, we would sort of, we had a little bit.ly link that we would check in. How did this work for you? Um, all the way to um, checking in with folks and a whole host of just sort of evaluative or checking in elements around our, our, our Q&A sessions during our, our webinars, our workforce and contractor equity um, uh, workshops and design sessions. So been a lot of evaluation throughout our events. And then um, as we think about the, this particular RFP and the evaluation that's gone into that, I want to just start with, we've done a lot of debriefs, both with panelists, uh, you know, connecting with folks that did the eligibility review, uh, doing a lot of um, evalu doing evaluation with folks that aren't scoring, um, you know, the staff scoring, the technical review, folks uh, doing evaluation of folks that did the GHG review. Um, and, so, and, and so we've done a lot of those debriefs and we still need to do those continued evaluation and interviews with you all, as well as some additional scoring panel members. There's about four more. Um, there's been a whole host of just application data analysis. So it's part of the application process. We did a lot of scoring applications. Oh, I just wanted to note that Shanice joined us um, just a couple just a couple of minutes ago. Shanice Clark, who is our committee, who is also on the committee and had to join late today. Sorry, go ahead, Tim. Thank you and welcome, Shanice. Thank you for being here with us here on, a, on such a beautiful evening. Um, okay, so then so then there's just a bunch of application data. So that's that's also information that we are using in order to come back to you all and say, okay, we might not need that question in the next application because everyone scored a four on that question, or that question was a particularly challenging question for this type of organization. So we're going to be using, we're going to be coming back and that's already information that we're working through that, that, that we've been digesting and working through as we've just started to, started to do an initial screen. So that's also information we're working on is just the scoring as well as the, the outcomes who actually got the grants and that, 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 that feeds in our evaluation in terms of those that tended to score better. Um, there's a, these interviews that we have just I've mentioned a little bit before, and then there's, there's going to be community conversation. So we're both interviewing, we're, we're doing a, several interviews with, and we've got a, a, a matrix of, of interviews that we're breaking down with um, applicants. So applicants that were awarded grants, applicants that weren't awarded grants, applicants that applied for planning grants, applicants that applied for application support grants, got those, applied for a full grant, didn't get those. So we've got a whole host of um, interviews that we're conducting um, and, and being led by Janet and, and, and a team of interns that are that are reaching out and, and, and interviewing all those um, all those applicant organizations. Um, and then there's an element that we're going to be getting here as we are onboarding our grantees and as they begin their project work, and that that comes through with just the grantee reporting and the project verification work that's going to be happening. So there's just going to be, and that's going to start to really speak to not less the how we did in getting to here and more about what are we getting and what are the outcomes of these grants. Um, and then there's work ultimately the reporting subcommittee. So that's just a little overview that when we talk about evaluation, it's a pretty broad realm of many things that we're doing. And we've taken, we've had, a, I'd say, an evaluation lens and really a, how do we improve um, the work that we're doing throughout everything that we've done. And, and then there's, there's more formal evaluation. So um, with that, I'll stop talking and try to uh, see time back to 
I don't know if I exceeded time. I think I might have used the polls on, but I'll give I'll I'll, I'll turn it <laughs> over to the the reporting subcommittee. So thank you. Hi, I think it's me. Hi, everybody. Um, yes. Sorry, you're hearing a lot from me tonight, and you also might be hearing the ice cream truck in the background because it's driving around Foster Powell, Mount Scott Arleta, Woodstock right now, which is where I live. Uh, anyway, so if I'm a little distracted, it's because I can hear the the bells from the ice cream truck. But I'm here to give a quick update from our committee, and it, Sam really teed it up really well because I think Sam emphasized how since the beginning of PSAF, staff and the committee have really brought a big emphasis on the idea of like reflecting, evaluating, and reporting out to the public. And Sam pointed out the strong connection to our guiding principles, uh, particularly to accountability and um, to community powered, because a lot of the data we're reflecting on comes from input from the community. And then of course, a lot of the metrics we're gonna be talking about are about the, multi, the climate action with multiple benefits and justice driven component. So that's kind of the like setup for this committee. And I'm talking for a little bit here and then I'll, I also wanna mention that the staff supporting the committee are Janet and Angela and then Maria and Ranfeast are my fellow committee members on the committee. Uh, and we've been meeting, I, I think uh, one of our big points that we wanted to make tonight is that um, We've actually been meeting for some months now. I think we've had something like six to eight meetings. Janet can, can confirm the exact amount. Um, and I, we realized that the last committee, broad committee meeting that we hadn't uh, maybe communicated clearly to you all and you all didn't even necessarily know that we were meeting and doing things. So part of why we wanted to report back to you tonight is um, to complement this period we're in, which is we're taking a little bit of breathing room after RFP1 and also to give an update on what this subcommittee has been up to. So um, we've been meeting and we have some plans. And this slide gives like a sense of the, the activities we've been up to since December and looking forward. So you can see December, Mar like historically from December to now, we were working on developing our name and purpose. You'll see more about that in a minute. So this is the very exciting name we've come up with, reporting and evaluation subcommittee, but we think it's very clear and straightforward. Uh, and we have more on our purpose in a minute. We also worked with Sam and gave a lot of feedback on that council report that went to city council uh, alongside the, the, the grantee recommendations uh, about a month ago. Um, so that was kind of like a public communications piece, but a little bit of reporting out. Um, and we've been involved in a lot of the, the stuff Sam talked about in terms of RFP1 evaluation. So we've been in conversation about who should be involved and what that should look like and kind of giving input into that process about involving grantees, a whole scope of grantees, those that got grants and didn't, involving staff, and then that hopefully now involving us as committee members with these interviews, perhaps dual interviews and um, email exchanges. So we've given input on those. And then the other four buckets of work we're up to, we've started some of them and some of them are in the future. I'll mention two and then I'm gonna to pass to Ranfees to mention um, a couple others. But one really is these RFP feedback sessions. So that's really kind of a subset of RFP one evaluation, but we'll be uh, involved in deliberating upon the findings from all these RFP feedback. So that's kind of coming forward in June. And I feel like that's, we've already talked a fair amount about that today. So I won't say a whole lot more about that to um, save time. And then the other thing, um, that I'm going to talk about is the metrics draft and approach, but we have a whole slide on that. So before we get there, I'm going to pass to Ranfees, who's going to talk about the other two on their workforce and development goals and program review and audits. So Ranfees. Yeah, thanks, Megan, for the overview, and I'll probably be pretty short um, here. Um, you know, I think, one, I think it'll be, you know, I think, again, that the role of this committee is, one, making sure that we're discussing um, again, how we're doing reports. So I think, again, as, as noted, this is how the community holds us accountable. So making sure that it's living somewhere. So uh, for workforce uh, and contractor development, uh, there's a possibility that this is something that could live with the High Roads Committee. But I think what's really important is that we as a subcommittee know where, where it's living and can provide the recommendations for the full committee to ensure that it is actually we are actually tracking this. We are actually, um, you know, uh, there's a place where this lives around where, how we're uh, reporting and evaluating around workforce 
uh, and contractor development, because I think this is a really important uh, key area, um, I think, for the community to hold us accountable. I know the community will, over time, give us ways to refine uh, and give feedback on how to assess um, how we're funding uh, these key areas. What's additionally really important here, um, and making sure that this actually does live somewhere, is uh, program reviews and program audits. So that is something that's spelled out within our PCEF charter. So it's not to say that we as a subcommittee will perform the charter, but making sure that it actually lives somewhere. So as you'll recall, uh, we had the city auditor do our initial audit here, but just to know that, you know, that's not exactly to expect that we'll have that process happen every single year. So it's really important for us as a committee uh, to really provide a recommendation to the full committee how we as a program are going to uh, fully assess, fully review, and uh, provide an audit um, again of, of how we're moving this program. And, and, and so again, this is a just another uh, way to address what's on the charter, but it's a way again for how uh, there's an opportunity for community feedback and a way for community to hold us accountable. So hopefully I captured these two items really well and succinctly. Uh, I will kick this back to you, Megan. Thanks, Grand Feast. And before I jump to the next slide, I should say, I should have said earlier that while well, one, one of our main goals is just to let you know what we're up to, but at the end, we've saved 10 minutes or so for your feedback and Maria is going to guide us in that. But as you're listening to us, we want you to be like reacting to, is this the right scope of work for this kind of, not just for the subcommittee, but for the whole idea of reporting and evaluation and how do you see all this fitting together and what might you want to be involved in and et cetera. And Maria will have discussion questions, but as you're listening, it's not just us reporting at you. We want you to react in a few minutes here. Um, but so Ranfi's covered how we see the idea of um, tracking workforce and development related numbers. And that's in the PCEF code also that we need to be tracking that as part of our work and uh, being involved in audits or doing our own sort of audits. And I'm gonna take us to the next slide or somebody's gonna take us this one. <laughs> so the last bucket of work we see is this high level metrics, which is probably a little jargony of a term, but really like the bird's eye view the, of the whole piece of program and like, what are we achieving? And really this is important from our accountability um, commitment because uh, we want to show the world, we want to show our voters in Portland and the residents of Portland that we are having the kinds of outcomes they were hoping for when they voted in favor of PSEF, right? So you might recall those, all the committee members, we actually collaboratively reviewed this list um, some meetings ago now, I think in fall sometime. Um, and we, I think tentatively thought it was a good start, the list. And I'm sharing it tonight, we're sharing it tonight, not because we don't want to spend a lot of time like reacting to the specifics of the list. We will come back to this in the not too far future. But for now, just to remind us that we have these like big goals we want to meet. And in the code, Sam pointed out, we have both a mandate and a mindset. And in the code, it says we need to be doing you know climate action and um, benefiting piece of priority populations. So a social justice component. I um, mean, this slide really just breaks that down into like more measurable stuff. So we've got these high level metrics within all of them, there'd be a focus on priority populations. So that would be applied to like each of these bullet points. And then we are imagining looking at clean energy, um, having those bullet points underneath there, a big one, obviously greenhouse gas reductions. And you can see the other ones underneath there. Uh, within the bucket of green infrastructure and regenerative agriculture, there's a proposed list, again, leading with greenhouse gas reductions, but also other things around planting and et cetera. And then some ideas under workforce development and contractor support. So the idea is over years of grants, we'd have these big numbers we'd get to point out. Numbers alongside stories, because I know that's a big thing our committee has talked about, um, but that would tell the story of what we've accomplished from both like a quantitative and a qualitative storytelling approach. So we'll come back to this in future meetings, um, but we just wanted to like remind uh, all of us that this is, something we all kind of tentatively agreed to at a historical meeting and that our reporting and evaluation subcommittee has in mind. And then can you advance to the next slide? So really, we just wanted to repeat this slide because I, it's like the key visual here, um, that here's what we're up to, keep 
uh, here's the timeline we're imagining. And really, I think we want to turn it over to you all to, to react to us. So we've got some questions, and I'm going to pass it over to fellow subcommittee member Maria to facilitate us. Thank you. Let's move ahead to the discussion slides so we can put some of these prompts up. If you're not exactly ready to jump right in and comment on specific things that we presented, we really just wanted to start off in asking you uh, what, what's generating interest for you. Does it feel like our accountability part of our values is aligning or is being met with some of the activities and general metrics that we were sharing here. So if you haven't been able to share a whole lot in the meeting so far, I encourage you to just share your reactions so they have to be fully thought out. Could be things that you are thinking through and maybe you'll inspire somebody else to add to that or to also reflect on it the way you have been. So it's it's really a starting point for us to start talking to you. If you don't feel comfortable um, revealing all of your thoughts and ideas on the spot here, we also want to open up the idea that you can chime in to our subcommittee without officially joining another subcommittee. We want to make room for committee input somehow outside of this meeting and in the subcommittee without feeling like you have to completely commit to a, another set of of bi-weekly meetings, for example. So feel free to add in like how you think committee members should chime in, how you can do maybe a, a lesser lift than some of the committee members and how you might want to squeeze into this um, within some of the timeline markers that we laid out there too. I'm just waiting for Robin to raise his hand, but I'll take any takers. <laughs> he did. Robin. Thank you, Katie. I'm just waiting for you to make it official. <laughs> I was, I was going to wait, but then you, you kind of teased me, so I'll, I'll pose my question. Uh, this is more of a clarifying question. Um, you know, in, when you're reporting the metrics, um, is, that, is that information based upon what's forecasted in the applications, or is that going to be what really happened a year or two, you know, after implementation? Is, is there a means to measure, you know, the solar panel system that gets installed, are we going to ask the grantees to say, you know, we did X, Y, and Z in, in their grant report. So I'm kind of curious at what point, what data are you collecting? Do you want me to answer that? I, get, I, I will say it's a little bit of a hybrid, Robin. So it's definitely not what's in the application, but it, it's not, but it's modeled. It's modeled based on what is what actually gets built. So it's, we won't be going back. So like if a solar installation typically lasts 30 years, we won't be measuring it for 30 years or re requiring reporting for 30 years. But we can, you know, there are standard models that can estimate how much that panel will generate for the next 30 years. So it's, um, it's not exactly actual data, but it's definitely um, more accurate and precise than what's in the application at the application stage. Would you like us to go back to the other slide, the graphic with the high-level metrics? Yep. Thanks, Janet and Angela, for dressing this one up for us. <laughs> We're trying on the graphics and not quite like uh, showing our billion-year evolution, but this is almost as fancy. Are there any other items around our guiding principles that you might want to tease out in this conversation? Um, we've been focusing mostly on accountability, but certainly our, our other ones are just as important to address within the subcommittee's work. Any thoughts on how we can continue to emphasize equity and climate together and how they show up in our metrics? Faith, and then Jeffrey. Uh, 
Jeffrey, if you want to go ahead, go for it. I was I was just feeling like, you know, I got to I've got to contribute at some point and Maria's just begging us to. So I was ready. But if you've got something sure. to share, please do it. <laughs> and then I'll go. <laughs> no problem. I can go first. Um, yeah, the last uh, the workforce development and contractor support. Um, I see you have the four bullets I see more so uh, centered towards workforce development, but like contractor support. Um, like we're talking about DBEs, like things of that nature, like actual contractors uh, with the minority aspect to it. I think we need a couple bullets actually centered towards the contractor support aspect of it, because it seems like most of it is centered more towards the workforce. We'll take note on that. I'm sure all the subcommittee members just wrote it down. <laughs> if we could edit the slide now, we would, but thank you. Thank you. Faith, and then Shanice. All right, I'll jump in with something that's not nearly as useful as what Jeffrey just shared because it's just such so much more high level. But the um, one of the questions I, I was thinking about is, I didn't did I miss the slide that on purpose? Because I, I that's funny. Um, I think it. I think in the final meeting notes here it comes after our discussion questions, but it yeah. Okay, okay, great. Well, I just, I thought I possibly could have missed it. So perfect, we'll get to but, that. Uh, yeah, can whoever's advancing, <laughs> Katie, I think it's you advancing the slides. Oops, I guess we uh, maybe decided we would come back to this, but oh. are you talking about the purpose of the subcommittee specifically? So there are kind of, as Sam pointed out, we've been doing a lot of reporting and evaluations mm -hmm. as a full committee and as a program and staff, like lots of it over the last year and a half, but also the subcommittee is meeting and talking about like how do we kind of more formalize it put it in bylaws or something and etc so this right here in front of you is the language we've been workshopping we weren't quite ready to like bring it we weren't sure what the process was or quite ready to like workshop it with you all in great detail so we're sharing it kind of in a draft mode but um yeah you can see we said this would be our purpose is basically to both fulfill the mandate of the piece of code and also do some other things that we think are just important in terms of our mindset. So we say we're going to do those three things on here, which is the subcommittee would kind of develop alongside staff the whole process of reporting and evaluation. We'd focus both on achievements and process. Um, so like, you know, outcomes and processes. Um, we'd provide guidance to how we implement that. Um, so like how we're going to get feedback and et cetera, and that we'd be part of uh, we would bring things to the full committee for consideration. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what we came up with as the purpose of the subcommittee. Uh, that might be a little bit more narrow than your question of the purpose of reporting and evaluation more broadly, which I think goes back to more fulfilling our guiding principles and the mandate and mindset thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was after the subcommittee, so this is really helpful. And so it sounds like this is also a standing committee, right? Yeah, we actually were talking about... Um, we were talking about that and what it means and how often we meet, but yeah, I think we're imagining it as an ongoing standing committee yeah, because yeah. of and the importance of it. And it might not always have to be the three of you, right? <laughs> like I assume that you'll be asking others to also um, be showing interest at some point. That's so that's super helpful, and I really appreciate you all doing this work. And I love the mindset that that like that you're calling attention to that this isn't just a requirement of the code or a requirement of a grant program, but it's actually a mindset that's baked in at, at every stage. So I really appreciate that. When I was looking at the, this one com additional comment is, um, when I was looking at the criteria, I was wondering if from that criteria, when we have all these big numbers in a few years that are associated with each of these little bullets, will we be able to say that we got to the truth of what the program was intended to deliver? Will we be able to say that there's an equitable distribution of wealth, of opportunity, of power, um, of uh, ability to protect oneself and shield from climate change? And I'm maybe the answer is yes, but I, I that's what I'm sitting with. It's kind of like, are these the right things that are going to be able to tell us that yes, we've made a mark on those really big. The bigger picture of transition that we're working for. It's eight o'clock right now, but I do really want to give Shanice um, an opportunity to ask a question or a comment. So hopefully, if folks can just hang with us for a few, for a little bit past eight, that would be great. Shanice? 
in the it'll, it'll be brief um, I think, um jeffrey's comment was a lot a lot more helpful than what i want to share but just mostly wanting to affirm and appreciate um the work that y'all have laid out here and um i'm resonating especially as we think about um or just have vernacular around greenhouse gas emissions and that quantifying it being if it, it felt um like a big focus if you will of what climate measuring the climate impacts of projects so i appreciate this discussion and um thinking about housing and wealth um and and workers could be um could be really valuable here and um curious about these kind of cadence of what how how y'all are approaching what's next and, and how how I can support you. Thanks, Shanice. Maria, did you have anything else you wanted to add or questions or anything before we close out? Well, I think Faith laid it out pretty well. We weren't quite on the level of asking anyone to adopt our subcommittee's purpose and goals, but just start thinking about that now on, on how we could formalize what we're working on. We also did not reveal that we want to continue recruiting for a subcommittee participation as maybe people might transition out or move around to different subcommittees if they see that, oh my gosh, this is not exactly where I wanna spend my time every Tuesday, Thursday. But you know, I think this is something we wanna think about. How do we formalize committee participation and decision-making inside and outside of the subcommittee? Where are the critical input areas for committee, community, and community in subcommittee? I think there's a lot of that logistical stuff that we have to work through on how do we bring in community members into subcommittee spaces if there's a desire for that. And we want some of you to weigh in if you can on, on what that structure or process could potentially look like. Yeah, this is a grand piece if, if I can if I can just add, I think I think it would be helpful, you know, for us to revisit this at some point and and approve this as a as a charter, um, as just a, a practice, um, you know, especially as we consider um, creating different subcommittees that it's clear and transparent for for all committee member many members um, when a subcommittee is created and when it's active and what its purpose and charge is and how it's ac accountable to the full full committee. So I think it's to me it's really important as a as a mindset, if you will, that uh, we're taking reporting uh, and evaluation seriously as a committee. And I think that's just a, the way that I think the broader public will will measure us as a as a piece of committee. So um, I think the language is is here for folks to review and to digest. And I do appreciate all the comments. Um, you know, Jeffrey, that you brought up, I think it's clear, like there's, you know, the initial ideas that we had last year, like it was not comprehensive enough to reflect, you know, how do we measure and assess our programs and its impact around subcontracting. You know, I think Faith, you brought some really good points um, and, and Shanice as well and, and Robin. And I think, I think those are things that it's helpful to have a body <clears throat> within the full committee where that lives and, you know, doesn't need to be us three it can always, um, change, but at least that we know that a body exists, I think is really helpful um, for the full life of this program. Maria, I saw your hand go back up. Yeah, I wanted to go back to Shanice's comment. And also anybody who says that they're worried that what they're contributing is not helpful is all helpful. And um, we don't want you to hesitate to share. And that's why we have subcommittee members too, because Megan and Rampi know I'm just still formulating ideas and I'm talking through it with them. And they've just been so great and supportive in that space, along with Janet and Angela. But um, Shanice, I think there's a lot of work to be done too in thinking through how do we evaluate planning grants and how do we also demonstrate that what we've generated from, from that kind of funding is also creating meaningful change and impact and that these tools are also making space for success uh, to be um, evaluated 
there. So anybody has wisdom to share in any form or any which way, or even if it's minutes or hours, please um, do join in. I remembered the sticky notes we had on our Jamboard and some of you dragged it to reporting and evaluation. So we're going to bring that back and see if we can pull some of you in from time to time. The Jamboard doesn't forget. <laughs> All right, I feel like that those are pretty good closing words, um, unless any other committee members want to um, add anything before we go or Sam. No, but I know that Maria has her hand up and I, I suspect I think I might know why. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, I, okay, uh, no, so wait, I, just I for fun, it. I do have my hand up because maybe I want to give Michael a chance this time because he couldn't have been eating his dinner this whole time. I'm just kidding, Michael. <laughs> I, uh, I, <laughs> I am, um, I'm a little exhausted tonight, uh, but uh, so I've been listening. Um, I'm definitely going to come back with some feedback uh, over the next couple meetings because I know we're coming back to all of these uh, and this was just sort of uh, putting, um, putting the questions out there. So I'm looking forward to coming back with some, uh, with some better questions, um, some better feedback uh, and uh, maybe even uh, an idea. All right. Thanks, Michael. Okay. I know that there was talk about a different way of closing out, but I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not seeing it. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and think no, that that may be it. We may let, we... is, I think Ramfis is up for it. <laughs> Ramfis? <laughs> I'm being put on the spot here, but um, so I, I had proposed this to Sam and uh, Maria to consider and, and, and Michael and, you know, I think, uh, if, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I come from this uh, social justice movement around immigrant rights and particularly around the farm worker movement, right? So uh, oftentimes, um, in, in events and rallies, especially where communication has been a barrier, uh, we've been taught uh, uh, the unity clap, which has been an approach to sort of uh, help convey victories, whether small or large, uh, but to, uh, a way to build community, uh, especially where either communication is a barrier or for us today where distance is a barrier. Uh, and so the unity ha clap has a history. Uh, the history comes from uh, the farm worker movement, um, uh, you know, f several decades ago, um, uh, Latino farm workers and Filipino farm workers uh, were organizing together um, to uh, improve uh, worker conditions uh, and improve uh, uh, wages and benefits for workers. And so uh, for a variety of reasons uh, and racist laws, um, there's just far fewer labor standards of protections for workers, uh, for farm workers. Uh, and so the unity clap uh, was a, uh, uh, introduced as a way to rally both Filipino farm workers uh, and uh, Latino farm workers. And so I will try to model it. It's generally starts as a slow clap uh, and the pace will increase over time. This is gonna be a, a little bit of challenge here in Zoom. So I will try to best model. So. I see everyone here is on mute. So I'm gonna ask you all to unmute if you can for this, for this final portion. Uh, and I will be patient and wait till everyone is uh, unmuted. Uh, okay, so I see folks are now unmuted. So we're gonna, I'll, I'll try to model. It's gonna be a slow clap. We'll try to keep in unison. Uh, and then it's going to increase slowly over time, okay? so. Hopefully this is successful, but I will start slowly. Thank you everyone for entertaining uh, that. And it was my suggestion of a way for us to close out and
close out, especially in some metrics occasions and where we feel like we've made some movement. So appreciate everyone for entertaining this and, and, and joining me on this Unity Clap. Thank you, Ramses. Awesome. And thank you everyone, members of the public as well. Have a good night. Love to that, Ranfis. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye.